Welcome to Building Better Worlds, where we celebrate voices around the world that are helping to forge a shared and abandoned Web3 future. I'm your host, Vivi Lin. Our guest today is a crypto native and veteran metaverse player. Now let's welcome Pendu Sashjowadoyo, co-founder of Devio. Hi, Pendu. So nice Hello. to have you on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here all the way from beautiful Miami, Florida. Wow. Yeah, beautiful beach there. Now you are, I know that you are ahead of the curve in many ways, um, especially in the crypto space. And you know, you don't need me to tell you that how fascinated I am by a lot of things you've done. Um, but for the viewers and listeners who don't know you yet, um, could you tell us more about yourself and also the things that you're working on? Sure. Um, my name is Pandu Sastra Doyo. I'm actually decentricity on Twitter, so that's actually easier to search for. Uh, I've been in crypto since 2013, uh, around 2013. I bought my first Bitcoin in the metaverse, actually, believe it or not. So I've actually been in, on the metaverse for actually longer than I've been in crypto. I've been on the metaverse for over 10 years. So I started uh, in Second Life. Uh, that was back in 2012. Um, and I was a landowner. Uh, I actually lost my land in Second Life in 2017, even though it had like thousands of visitors monthly. Um, and this is uh, sort of like something that that sort of inspired me to think about ownership structures and you know uh, the ownership of digital objects and data. Um, I actually started uh, the Indonesian Blockchain Association, um, which helped make crypto legal in uh, my home country, which is Indonesia. Uh, there are several Forbes articles about that effort. So uh, crypto is a class of commodities. And uh, that's sort of like, um, you know, back then there was a debate whether it should be currency should be treated as currencies and the Indonesian central bank said no it shouldn't be part of like currencies it shouldn't be treated as uh, one at least like there's still ongoing debate uh, but we basically took the third option in that debate and uh, talked to the commodities bureau and basically helped get uh, crypto introduced as commodities in Indonesia as an asset class and uh, that came with that came legal recognition Indonesia has around what 13, 14 exchanges, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, uh, mostly under the Indonesian Blockchain Association as well. So that was back between like 2018, 2000, uh, 2019, um, a couple of years. Um, then like in 2020, I was focused on building. There's a lot of uh, things that, I, that we built. 2000, um, well, we started building since 2018 to so like, we did we did a lot of things in 2018, but like 2019 was like our, our focus year of building. Uh, we've built a lot of things uh, for, for banks, for our companies. Um, we finally created sort of like a true Web3 decentralized project. Um, and uh, that's back in 2000, uh, uh, at, well, basically the end of 2020. Uh, end of 2020, we initiated the DeBio network, uh, which is my baby. Uh, I'm the CEO of that. Um, uh, I also initiated um, Myriad Social, which is another project on the Web3 space. Uh, I actually ha helped write the white paper. So it's not just me, it's like multiple people, but like it's like in the same space. Um, and uh, more recently, I uh, um, did Reality Chain, which is uh, another uh, uh, crypto uh, project uh, that is focused on a different thing, which is the metaverse. Um, our focus tonight is probably going to be DeBio, uh, but there are multiple things that we're doing in parallel. Uh, but like our, my primary focus is, is DeBio at the moment. That's great. You know, like there's a lot, a lot of information we, we would like to unpack, right? So you're definitely wearing many hats. Um, so let's start with DeBio, your baby, right? So, um, you know, we know that, of course, biological, from the biological point of view, genes are one of the most important data uh, mm -hmm. of a person. And you know, like you, you mentioned that the decentralization and also your, your Twitter, Twitter handle is decentricity. So what kind of problems does DeBio hope to solve? So uh, DeBio actually, we initiated DeBio in a, like, well, I initiated DeBio uh, as a concept back in 2017. Uh, I spoke about it in several uh, seminars. Uh, and uh, during one of those seminars, I actually made, uh, made like a key observation that, uh, there that, uh, you know, the issue with like, biological data uh, being uh, being sequenced uh, and uh, being put 
in companies that are doing personal genetic testing, companies such as 23andMe and Ancestry.org, uh, that's sort of a double-edged sword. First, you are able to actually see uh, what your genetics look like, and uh, you can basically sort of like uh, know like your genetic destiny, which which is not a destiny, of course, but like yeah, you at least know your <laughs> for certain illnesses, and uh, that's a positive. That's a net positive. But the way uh, that the world is currently doing it, well, that the uh, was I think not. Right, like because because here's the thing, like um, because the world is using traditional Web two structures for the data, and yeah. that's not a very good idea when uh, we are actually having this, you know. And this is, of course, 2017 was far before the pandemic, but you know what's happening now. After the pandemic, there's been a lot of privacy issues. There's been a lot of issues of control, and as we know, like all the medications, vaccines are all uh, built out of research data that is actually very, very valuable. Um, another thing that, that uh, I think is very key is that data doesn't flow back to the user. Uh, your genetic data, when you are sequencing your genetic data in many of these structures, um, these are used to uh, basically research uh, medications, treatments that are multi-billion dollar industries in their own right. Um, and that doesn't flow back to you. That doesn't flow back in terms of value to, to you uh, as the owner of your own genetic data. So uh, just I, as a factoid, and I'm not accusing them of anything, but like 23andMe is 33% yeah. owned by GlaxoSmithKline, which yeah. is a drug company, a pharmaceuticals company that does bio, biopharmaceuticals as well. So that's uh, sort of like, yeah, that's sort of the origin of uh, what we were trying to do. 2017, uh, was sort of like uh, basically trying to get the concept off the ground. Um, I have sort of a background in bioinformatics. I have never been a bioinformatician per se, but I worked as one in college. So uh, I'm an environmental engineer by training. I focus on bioinformatics as well. I focus on microbiology. So I did uh, I did uh, bioinformatics and I did uh, uh, microbiology. I was an assistant my, uh, for for a lab microbiology lab. So uh, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I don't go through with it. I focus on IT after I graduated, but um, I've always been like, there's always been a soft spot in my heart. So uh, I've, I have a lot of microbiologist friends uh, who like I discussed uh, this concept with. And uh, the thing that we realized is that there, if you, we want to make a, a platform that actually uh, goes uh, like head to head, with the big boys, with the, the large uh, uh, bioinformatics companies. Yeah. We need to have a platform that is not just one lab. It needs to be a myriad of labs. It needs to be like multiple labs working together. Um, mm -hmm. and that's all sort of what we made. We made a platform, a bioinformatics and biomedical platform on the blockchain, which is decentralized and also decentralized in another way, labs can onboard. You can onboard your own lab. You can onboard your own things, uh, your own services, and create sort of like a, a, a storefront for your services. And then like people can basically buy your service, buy your uh, genetic testing services through this platform and uh, interact with you uh, anonymously um, and uh, pay with tokens and uh, receive basically your your you know uh, your test data, your your results, either the sequencing data, et cetera, or even genetic analysis directly in the application in a way that is sovereign to you. So that's sort of like the honest of the idea. And then that's uh, 2020, we we put in a white paper, we we started going around and, uh, and asking for, uh, you know, people uh, seed funding and angel funds for, for it. And uh, we managed to raise uh, um, uh, some uh, funds and we, uh, originally wanted to do it on Ethereum. So uh, we won uh, uh, actually one of the hackathons at ETH Denver, Ethereum Denver yeah. last year. Um, and, uh, and then we decided like we need something that scales better because we were trying to build an entire stack. It's not just a smart contract layer, but the entire stack, including you know, even like uh, optimizing the consensus layer even. So we looked around and we uh, decided to do Substrate. So uh, I have a team of developers. I've had a team of developers for a while um, and uh, they're agnostic developers. They're not just Ethereum. So it was quite easy for me to basically resource the um, uh, Substrate people. 
So substrate, uh, we built it on substrate. We managed to do it uh, for a bit, and then we looked at you know Polkadot and Kusama. Polkadot and Kusama are, are um, you know on, an awesome ecosystem that we love. Uh, the wallet, our wallet is Polkadot, but of course there's a uh, you know uh, the problem of you know getting this off the ground without uh, going through yeah. uh, hoops. So we looked at them. the auctions. The auctions could be very expensive for on yes, Polkadot. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. the thing. Like, we, 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 we really wanted to do it in a way that is economic and uh, can get this idea off the ground as, as fast as possible. Like, uh, because we, 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 we decided that this is, this is something that needs to be shown, like this is something that needs to be built. So um, we approached the Octopus Network and uh, we, we heard from like a bunch of friends that they're doing uh, sort of like a, a substrate, but on Nier. Well, and we're familiar with Nier uh, actually, because we've been, you know, uh, Paras is actually one of the NFT marketplaces on near uh, there in Indonesia. So we're aware of them. I'm in Indonesia as well, back, there, back last year. So uh, we're aware of near. we're aware of the technology. So um, we decided to move over to Octopus. Um, that's sort of like the journey in a nutshell. There's a ton of other mm -hmm. things, but uh, the problem that we solve is the problem of basically flowing uh, that, you know, the, the genetic value back to the user. Uh, creating uh, a way for labs, multiple apps to be competitive uh, together, uh, hand in hand against like the big bio uh, uh, companies and uh, doing it all uh, through a privacy first, anonymous first platform. Yeah, I think the idea of you know owning your own data and doing it in a decentralized way makes a lot of sense. And and then also I'm I'm glad you know, um, you know you found through the journey you found yourself in a in a really good spot to have your own app chain and in a very cost effective way to bootstrap everything. And so how is it going so far? You know what kind of genetic analysis services would you offer? And could you just give us a little bit the latest data of of Debio? Sure. So the current development stage, of course, we launched uh, late, late last year uh, on mainnet and then like it was uh, focused on just a few things. Uh, we're adding features as we go. Um, uh, in fact, I will be basically releasing sort of an update video in a couple of weeks uh, regarding everything that we've done since then. But uh, the, the thing that we already have live right now uh, are basically the lab requests. So you can already request for labs to come to your area. Like if you're in uh, Singapore or you're in Miami and there are no DBIO labs in the area, you can basically request labs by staking your tokens. So this is something that we're extremely proud of, staking tokens to request labs. So it is, uh, well, everyone everyone in the DeFi uh, field basically knows about staking and uh, usually staking is you know staking to get tokens. This is staking to get labs taking to get services uh, into the platform. So you're actually helping us grow the ecosystem when you're staking. Now, once you're staking, um, the labs can basically see on, a, on an actual map, a world map uh, of like the demand, the actual demand uh, throughout the world of like uh, people's tokens. Now uh, from that demand map, uh, labs can choose, okay, I'm going here, I'm going there. Uh, or maybe a lab in Miami who's only active in Miami can realize, oh, actually there's a lot of demand for, for this service and I happen to provide it. So it helps us in our marketing as well. Um, we found where it since like two labs. Well, uh, one is still, we're, we're still going to be announcing it really soon. Uh, we're, there's a, a, also a genetic consultant that we onboarded as well. So here's one of the things that we're trying to do is to have uh, sort of uh, a utility within the, the platform itself uh, by first uh, having the staking mechanism be uh, something that's translatable to the real world because uh, it's staking, but also bringing in uh, you know, actors to the ecosystem. And at the same time, uh, if you want to provide services, you will also have to uh, stake your DeBio tokens. So if you are a genetic consultant, for example, you're a genetic consultant, you are your KYC, by the way, in terms of like the genetic consultants, the labs, et cetera, they're all KYC. Uh, so uh, we're using, we're sort of using the kill uh, mechanism of social KYC. So basically to, 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 to get their, their KYC um, onboarded uh, in a way that is still very decentralized. But point is like once these, uh, these actors are onboarded, they can stake tokens to uh, provide services. So the DeBio is taking here provides services to people who are who are the users of the platform. Now, yeah. once once that is done, once that, uh, all the structures are done, 
uh, like we we already have this life. Like everything is already alive. But like uh, once, uh, uh, like uh, so, I'm just taking you through it. But like uh, once everyone stakes, once uh, the uh, the basically there is a demand and and basically a, a, a demand and supply in the market. Um, anything that goes through the uh, bio is anonymous. Like everything, like even though it starts with KYC for the for the labs, the users are never requested KYC. In fact, KYC is not necessary per se uh, to actually request services. Which means um, you would be able to get your you know your sequencing data totally anonymously. And this is probably the only way, like the only uh, sort of like service that provides this. There's no other service that actually can provide this. Like if you go to your, to your hospital and get like genetic testing, of course you can get uh, get genetic testing, but they'll know your name, they'll know your KYC. Um, that's sort of something that we're shooting for. Um, we are going to develop a few more things this year, including uh, uh, more services for electronic medical records. We're trying to do something called a second opinion marketplace, which actually uses your electronic medical records or personal health records actually to uh, basically help get diagnosis from doctors. So uh, sort of a decentralized, not WebMD, sort of a decentralized, uh, uh, well, uh, get second opinion consultancy from doctors. So it's again, anonymous one way for the users is anonymous, for the doctors it's KYC. So we know that uh, they're real doctors and they register. Um, I think this is very important. It sounds uh, very, uh, you know, this sounds very different from any other project. Like uh, a lot of the other DeFi, even from my other projects, like, even from my other projects, DeFi is different because this is something that is real world, very extremely real world that yeah. bridges directly to, you know, DeFi structures, uh, crypto structures in a way that is uh, very decentralized as well. So we're quite proud of it. We're very, very confident of it. We've uh, developed many things and we'll continue developing. Yeah, I'm actually very curious because exactly like you said, you're doing something, you're disrupting, you know, the, the genetic kind of uh, industry. And but and then you combine DeFi, you know, blockchain, and all that, you know, which is very vertical, you know, it's not mainstream. So it's really one of those very real use case in the crypto space. So um, I'm curious, you know, like where are your primary markets so far, you know, right now? And, you know, okay. uh, in sure. Asia, in the US and, you know, where... We're starting in Indonesia. Uh, we have genetic consultants in Indonesia uh, that are, one has been onboarded and uh, the lab that we started was in Indonesia as well. So uh, there are two categories of services in Dubai. One is like the physical services where you take physical samples. So physical samples necessarily it needs to be like local. Like I send to hyper-local impact, like I send to my, my Miami basically um, uh, in terms of the samples. That's physical. Uh, the digital part, like if you already have, for example, um, I don't know if you've gotten sequence at 23andMe, for example, mm -hmm. like, and, and you want to basically find out something that 23andMe didn't cover, for example, didn't, didn't cover in their report. Um, or you want a second opinion, is uh, 23andMe uh, actually uh, giving me the correct diagnosis for this or something like that. Uh, you can actually already onboard onto the platform and basically request for genetic uh, analysis. So um, so that is already live and you can do it from all over the world. You can do it from Singapore, you can do it from the US. Um, of course, this is not a diagnostic tool. This is something that is informative only because like if it's a diagnostic tool, there are sub, uh, different hoops to jump through, but uh, this is already something that is usable for analysis of your genes. So once you actually have that, uh, you, if you already have, uh, I don't know, an, an old 23andMe, uh, genome file that that you you got like a year a couple of years ago you can actually even reuse it because like you know the genetic testing um, academia especially after COVID is you know uh, progressing in an intense pace so uh, yeah we can we can provide that those services are available internationally already That's in terms of, yeah. In terms of the physical services, of course, uh, we're still uh, rolling it out. We are open for labs to collaborate with us. Any lab from all over the world uh, can collaborate with us. Uh, there are some TNCs. I think there are some regions that uh, we cannot operate in, but like uh, I think um, most of the US, we can. I think there's a state in the US that has issues. Most of Asia, we also can. Uh, like I think it's all in the TNC as well. So you can. 
you can take a look at that. Uh, that's sort of like the details. Uh, the details, details are all on the site. Details are all on the application as well. Um, and if you're a lab that wants to provide physical services, of course, you can take a look at the map of demand uh, throughout the world. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm- That's great, great. Yeah, yeah. I think it that definitely has a lot of potential and, and mm. to potential to expand globally. Yeah. So now, okay, let's jump to another area, another topic, which is very interesting that we've been talking, uh, you know, a lot, uh, which is metaverse. I know that you've been yeah. in this place for almost a decade. You know, like you played in Second Life since 2012 and you're super active in the metaverse space. So what is your idea of metaverse and how is it going to change the world we're living in? Okay, so one of the things that I think would change the world is right now, even like you and me, we're in this discussion. Uh, we haven't met face to face. We feel like we're already friends, right? Like uh, that's uh, that's actually key to the metaverse. The key difference between a metaverse and a game is the social interaction. And uh, if you can actually replicate the social interaction of like physical social interaction inside a, a virtual world, then you have a metaverse. And I think that's sort of transformative uh, because that would change a lot of ways that we uh, do, do things like work, um, play, have interactions with others, anything with social situations. Now, we actually saw this happen and it's because of, of course, the pandemic, everyone moved over to Zoom, even though Zoom, they're not a metaverse per se, but like, you know, if, if tomorrow Zoom introduced the metaverse, uh, they make bank, right? Because like everyone's already using it. So um, th that is sort of a shift, a paradigm shift in terms of how we work. Uh, previously, if we're working remotely, we mostly interact probably through emails and then like, it evolved into like we're interacting through chats, through Discord servers, through Slack, for example. And now we're interacting with that. But like, in addition to that, we have Zoom. So the so, metaverse. Yeah, yeah I, I want to jump in a little bit because we've been in this virtual space for many years already, right? We have Web 2.0. We've been playing in Facebook and all that. But, you know, like I, I, I just would like to um, ask you to, to really... Um, shed light on you know the web 3.0 where blockchain comes in crypto comes in you know what difference does that make uh, in terms of youth uh, metaverse yeah so i i find it interesting that this actually relates back to my experience in second life where i had a building and mm -hmm. the building was taken away from me because back in 2018 i was super busy so i didn't actually notice that i didn't pay for my second life subscri subscription and i lost the land and wow. i can't get it back. Uh, the land is actually still there. If you go to the Pico Vista Museum of Computing, which is actually what I named my land, it's still there. It's still being visited by a lot of people. I think it at one time it like uh, had like a thousand visitors per month. Um, anyway, um, I that land I I built that land from scratch. They took it, and uh, that is sort of like mm, that's sort of like my World of Warcraft moment. I like to call it like yeah. because. It, you guys, you guys know this, like Vitalik, the reason he created Ethereum was because in World of Warcraft, his character got nerfed because like he had like this character he really liked and because of an update, he got rebalanced and then like uh, he his character wasn't as powerful anymore. And that's one of the things why like uh, I think uh, a lot of people need to realize this and people are starting to realize that centralized control isn't isn't yeah. good. And and, and yeah, it, uh, wouldn't, it wouldn't happen if this, everything's on chain and it's decentralized, right? Yes, the yes. platform cannot take away your land or your character, for example. Yes, exactly. There's also another reason for this, which is interoperability. Like uh, yeah. when you mint an NFT on, uh, like yeah. when it, we're on Nier, like, you, you mint uh, an NFT on Mintbase, it is interoperable with everything on Nier, actually, theoretically, because it's on the blockchain. Uh, if you mint something on OpenSea on Ethereum, uh, it is interoperable with a lot of marketplaces, with uh, 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 LooksRare, for example, like all, all the other kind of, uh, uh, NFTs as well. So this is actually something that is key. Um, a metaverse that is built on Web3, on blockchain, has the potential to be extremely interoperable. I can have my avatar be active in one metaverse and then bring it over to another metaverse. I can even bring my stats from one metaverse to the other and my items as well. Um, however, I have a concern here, very massive concern. You see a lot of the PFP projects out there, right? Like uh, all the cats, all of the apes, uh, everyone's doing their own. They're all promising a metaverse. The thing yeah. is, 
they're doing it themselves. They're not doing it based on like most of them, not all of them, but most of them are not doing it based on interoperable standards. They're doing it, they're doing another, yet another Web2 centralized metaverse that is not interoperable with all the other metaverses. And that's not a good thing. We're gonna yeah. end up with a balkanized version of the metaverse instead of a decentralized one. So um, that's why I created Reality Chain, by the way. So Reality Chain is a metaverse as a service, but it's metaverse as a service in a way that is fully centralized. So you basically can stake tokens for your community to generate a metaverse. So uh, if you're a PFP project, any PFP project, I don't know, board cats, let's say the board cats project, they want to set up basically a new metaverse. They just come to us, spins up a smart contract. The community basically puts in real tokens, which is the upcoming uh, real tokens on reality chain. And uh, yeah, and you spin up a metaverse. The metaverse is spun up. I, it's, uh, this is, we're trying to do it so that everything that's, uh, that's, that comes out of this is interoperable with each other. And mm -hmm. uh, we think that's a better way to do it than, than you know, having each PFE project have their own metaverse because that's going to be, you know, we're gonna get beat bad yeah. with the web yeah. two. Yeah, I think, I think when we are, if we are going to go into this web three, 3.0, Web 3.0 and Metaverse, we need to change the mindset from the Web 2.0, right? So we need to really connect with each other, not just like everyone doing their own, in their own domain, in their own kind of territory. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah, like uh, I would like to talk to you more about reality chain, but I think we are like have limited time here and there's still a lot of things I would like to, uh, to discuss with you. You know, you mentioned that, you know, you, you, you work in, you, you were, you know, uh, uh, Indonesia is your home country and you know you achieve a lot of things there you are like as a board member of the Indonesian blockchain association you know could you just tell us you know a, a little bit about the status of blockchain industry in Indonesia and what do you see the potential um, you know for, for the industry in, in the country in the area well so uh, Indonesia has like 13 or 14 exchanges I think I mentioned this Mm -hmm. And uh, still a lot more exchanges coming. Uh, I don't have the numbers with me right now, but like I know the numbers of like the number of citizens in my country, which is 280 million people. And 280 million people is a huge number, as we know. Um, there is a ton of um, basically new uh, regulations that, that came out in support, but, well, not new, like a year old, sorry. Uh, that came out in support uh, of this. Uh, there's a ton of uh, exchanges that, that are, are coming into Indonesia and trying to set up a basis. Um, and, and sort of like the thing that, that I think would be very transformative for Indonesia is uh, the tech part of things, because there's a lot of recognition about blockchain per se uh, from the government itself. Uh, and uh, there's a ton of things that are happening there. Uh, I think it, the potential is huge. Um, with that, it's a double-edged sword, of course. There's also uh, scammers coming into the space. And uh, mm -hmm. a lot of scammers coming into the space have sort of like uh, uh, limited sort of like our, it's, it's, you know, the way scammers come in um, basically makes it bad for the entire ecosystem, right? So uh, a lot of people are, like even people in government uh, are starting to basically think that crypto is all scammers. <laughs> so um, it's always a balance. There are like uh, things that we're doing uh, to ensure that it's, it's uh, everything's better. Um, Indonesia does uh, implement something of a whitelist system. So uh, not all crypto automatically is tradable in Indonesia. You do need to be whitelisted to get the whitelisting. You, there's a process that you need to go through which is why actually my, my company, Dibio, is actually in Singapore. We're a Singaporean company, uh, not an Indonesian company. Uh, we're hoping to get like uh, into Indonesia once we are actually listed there. But even with the whitelist, there's like 200 tokens, 220 uh, tokens that are already listed in Indonesia legally and are protected mm -hmm. by the law. So there's... Um, you own Bitcoin, Ethereum, like even if you own Doge, for example, you're uh, provide uh, you're you're technically protected by the Indonesian law enforcement. Um, so, I uh, yeah. Anyway, so Nier is also, of course, uh, a legal token yeah. in Indonesia. So 
legal. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, you're talking about basically compliance, right? So like government's legalization of in uh, and, and management basically of the crypto industry, while which is like pretty decentralized and kind of wild west. And and so there there is a kind of a balance between this these two. And um yeah, so what what do you think the um you know what do you think the trend would be in, in terms of compliance? You know, you see that a lot of countries started to legalize blockchain, while some countries ban blockchain uh, or not blockchain but crypto, um, mm-hmm. like China, for example. So, um, what is what do you think the trend will pan out? Mm. This is a very hard and um, this is a question with a very difficult answer because it, it actually um, depends really on the politics yeah. of uh, of my country and actually all the countries of the world because like crypto is part of politics now as we see in the russia ukraine conflict Definitely. and war uh that's sort of like uh people are, are are placing their bets and placing their uh pawns and positions uh and uh strategizing and to be frank bitcoin crypto Blockchain, that's part of strategy. And uh, it's the fun, the funny thing is it's part of strategy in both uh, you know, sides, sort of, because uh like even the CBDC people, uh people who are pushing for like a more centralized uh you know digital currency um yeah. to control uh to control policy, um, they are also using blockchain technology. Um yeah. Same time, the libertarians are focusing on crypto. This is a whole podcast of its own, Vivi. If we go into this rabbit hole, yeah, exactly. I know, I know. We just touch upon this topic, and we can, we can, we can discuss it on another. Yeah, like in, in details in another time. It's such an interesting topic. Yeah, yes, ex- exactly. I, I think you make a really good point that it has become like a tool for politics and for a lot of things for a lot of governments. So, so it's not only just kind of like a utopian for people mm-hmm. with you know, the dream of decentralization or whatever is not anymore. Actually, it's become more and more mainstream. And, you know, like, it's really very true out there. Um, okay. Mainstream so, becomes politics, is in my opinion. That's sort of like yeah. what I think. Yeah. So now let's address the topic of environment. Since, okay. you know, um, this is one of the concerns many people have for crypto, to be honest, and, and blockchain for, for the huge... Um, energy consumption. So do you think, do you know any projects, I know that you've been in this space, uh, do you know any Web3 projects that aim at tackling this issue? Oh, Open Forest Protocol uh, is one of the things that are, that's on near, of course, and then near itself is also a carbon neutral, I think they're a carbon neutral blockchain. Um, yeah. But, you know, at the same time, I, I also like, you know, I also defend the Bitcoiners, right? Like I also defend the, like even the proof of work people, right? Because like, uh, because of the, because, you know, proof of work uh, uh, creating value um, is a bit different from proof of stake creating value because like you have like, you know, real world costs of actually building um basically a mining rig, uh, computation, compute, basically, computronium. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, so I, I, I do think, in my opinion, and I, uh, I know it's not a common opinion, but um, there's still room for uh, the proof of work uh, uh, in terms of actually, you know, being a store of value, because that is, you know, pure compute, uh, that is pure hashing, and uh, the hash rates there are uh, actually like, um, what's the economic term for it? Sunk cost. There is a sunk yeah. cost. Sunk cost, yeah. Yeah. So once once that sunk cost is there, there's actually value that that is like, that that is uh, sort of like, because there is sunk cost, it is valued. And uh, that's actually a huge part of early Bitcoin. And, you know, I'm an older, I'm, I'm 37. I've been in this space for too long already. So uh, I, I have sort of like that opinion. At the same time, yes, I recognize that, you know, if you want something that's uh, more uh, carbon neutral for environmentally friendly, uh, blockchain can still do it as well, proof of stake, uh, any of the other uh, consensus mechanisms that is based on that. Uh, And uh, it creates its own very unique ecosystem as well, uh, which I see a lot on NIR. Everything that is created on top of NIR goes back to the fact that, you know, NIR is a state validator and uh, um, and there's uh, sharding involved as well. So I think 
Oh, by the way, I'm an environmental engineer. I think I mentioned it at the start of this podcast. Uh, so um, I think the uh, the future of the the like the space is proof of stake is what we're actually ha- oh, having here with like all the all the chains. But I think there's still room for uh, like the older value uh, generation mechanisms, um, and uh, I think that will be maintained uh, because that's less you know. Honestly, here's the thing, like, uh, and this is a tangent, but like, you know, a lot of people are saying that, you know, with a lot of like, um, if, if, if mining becomes very specialized, uh, then, you know, uh, the people who build mining rigs control uh, mining and uh, centralization will happen again. Um, true, but the thing is, uh, if you build like basically the proper, uh, you know, you, you can theoretically still build mining tools, like even with like other like non-specialist uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, rigs. So that there's still going to be uh, decentralization there. Now the, the, the question uh, whether, you know, uh, uh, proof of stake is doing things that are less decentralized. I think that's been hashed uh, and rehashed, uh, not a pun, but like it's been hashed and rehashed multiple times. I don't think that's that's the scope of our conversation here, but uh, there is something to be said about uh, ensuring that our uh, technologies uh, is uh, has basically like uh, uh, match to environmental uh, spend, like sort sort of like then this is this is sort of like taking uh, bringing it back to like the uh, carbon credits perspective, like uh, the more important things, the more. Th- Things that are they're they're more like uh, the uh, related to the way uh, the, uh, to, to max, maximum value uh, n- still needs to be in a uh, in basic using consensus that is uh, more decentralized. Well, like the things that are sort of less important or like less has less uh, uh, like impact if it fails can be in places that are more centralized. So that's uh, sort of like the the argument here is to have, like Louis Liu says um, from Octopus Network, an internet of blockchains. Um, and that's uh, like an internet of blockchains. What is that? Basically, it's just a right fit. Like if your blockchain is the right fit for this use case or that use case. Now, one of the main use cases is store of value. So uh, there is still things to be said about actually having a blockchain that is relatively not very environmentally friendly, but using it for store of value versus actually having, you know, a blockchain that is less, uh, you know, value store, but, uh, you know, more operational blockchain and then using, uh, you know, a consensus model that is yeah, less. I, I think the, the, the crypto and blockchain space definitely could, you know, have room for more, you um, to, to become more cost-effective and, you know, and more environmental. But like understand that, you know, this concern or this accusation um, might not be, might, might not be so accurate in some ways, but I, I mean, like, you know, we can, we can, we can go on and on about this, um, but, you know, due to the time limits, um, you know, like uh, this brings us to the end of our conversation and thank you so much Pandu for your insights I'm, I'm you know I'm so inspired and I'm sure the viewers and listeners out there um, I hope that they find it as inspiring as I do thank oh, you thank right. you Pandu thank you Vivi take care thank you thank you for joining us and please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our community by clicking the link below. And you can find me at Twitter at VivilinSV and let's build our Web3 future together.